Hello, hello church. I am honored to be with you for week two of Welcome Christmas, where we've been looking at some of the gifts that Jesus comes to offer us. This time of intentional reflection in December is one of my favorite things about Christmas. But to be clear, I usually just love Christmas anyways. Even if you take out all the Jesus stuff, the trees, the lights, the way that like strangers yell happy holidays, like we're really friends. I love this stuff. We've got elf on repeat on my house. It's, it's my jam. And then there's this chance that maybe I'll get a family picture with my kids where they'll actually cooperate wearing clothes that's not all torn up. Um, and again, maybe, no, no guarantees. Uh, and then there's the food, okay? Christmas food, December food, I love it. Uh, recently, I found out that my favorite aunt is not coming to uh, Christmas this year. She's gonna stay in Tijuana. And the first wave of grief that hit me was me realizing I wasn't gonna get her pozole this year, which is terrible. I know, I'm a bad person. This is my favorite aunt. But a pozole is that good. It's a light to me every single Christmas, along with the cheesecake and anything cheesecake related, okay? so. Usually I love the month of December, I typically really do, but this time of intentionally reflecting as a Christ follower, of this opportunity to kind of reclaim and refocus on who Jesus is and to reevaluate how am I doing at saying yes to the various gifts Jesus came to offer. If you're taking notes, go ahead and grab that outline. This is your first fill-in. Today, as we reflect on the gifts that Jesus gave us, we are going to be looking specifically at the ways Jesus offers us authentic peace. A key to reclaiming who Jesus is is understanding that he is the God of a kingdom of authentic peace. He's the king of peace. And that his spirit, the Holy Spirit, it dispenses peace. Now, last week we talked about this topic of hope. And hope and peace are oftentimes interrelated and they lead into one another. But I wanna make sure we understand from the front that these are two very separate gifts. When we think of hope, we usually think of something that's in the future. When we think of peace, it is something that is offered to us here and now. Hope often has this like anticipation, this expectancy that I trust God will do something and I'm waiting on that. But hope is in the here and now. If hope is the light at the end of the tunnel, peace is the light that we carry as we walk through the tunnel. The Bible talks to us about hope being something that we place our hope in God, but that peace is something God has given us, something he gives to us. Our key verse for today comes out of John 14. And this verse, I'm gonna reference back multiple times. This verse takes place um, when Jesus is letting his followers know, his friends, his disciples know, he's saying uh, he's about to be murdered and his friends are trying to wrap their head and their hearts around what, what is gonna happen and how this impacts them and how this impacts the person they love. And here's the message of hope, of peace, I'm sorry, the message of peace that Jesus offers them. Peace I leave you, my peace I give you. I do not give to you as the world gives. I love the fact that Jesus is letting us know this is different than what you're used to and what you expect. Do not let your hearts be troubled and do not be afraid. When Jesus says do not be afraid, he's not saying do not feel fear. He's saying "May, may may your peace rise above your fear. May your peace uh, be so big that it can rule you. Biblical peace equips and empowers us not to shrink back because our fear, to not act or choose out of our fear, to not be consumed by our fear. Years ago, I heard someone talk on the subject of, of fear in this way. If life were a road trip, fear would be allowed to come, but fear would not be able to touch the steering wheel, touch the AC, touch the radio. It's not gonna touch the GPS. Fear belongs properly buckled up in the back seat. And why is fear allowed to come? Because fear in and of itself is not a bad thing. It's just a human emotion. The problem with fear is that when it it goes unchecked, when it gets too big, when, when it becomes our truest truth. As a parent, there are certain things I hope that my kids have healthy fear of. I can look back on my younger years and say that there were things my parents wish I had feared that I did not fear. There is a way to engage with fear in a healthy way. And that is what God is inviting us into. This week, while reflecting on um, this idea of peace, um, everyone was upstairs sleeping and I was downstairs with a Christmas tree on and I was reflecting on, on this talk and looking into things when I remembered a specific Christmas that I did not want to put the Christmas tree up. 
We were in the midst of an intense custody battle, which included courts and lawyers with our oldest son. He was gone for two weeks during Christmas. It was the first time we had ever done a custody schedule that way. So it was this huge, big chunk of time during this fun holiday season that he was out. There was all these other things kind of happening. And then on top of that, it was just one of those Decembers um, where I found myself grieving my brother's death. I just missed him so much. At this point, he'd been dead for, he'd passed away 12, 15 years ago, whatever it was. But this particular December, the loss just felt so close and so real. And so in order to protect my heart, in order to guard my heart, I said, I'm not putting up the Christmas tree. I wasn't trying to be stubborn. It was me trying to say, how do I make this month more bearable? And by keeping Christmas out of my home, I felt like that was a protective step I could take. But now when I look back at that version of myself, now what I see is that that version of me didn't know how to grab hold of peace in the midst of real life. And I can look back at my life at key moments in my life and I can realize that neither of my parents modeled this for me. During these key markers in my life, I had one parent that was prone to depression, like clinical depression, plus she thought like a depressed person at that time in her life. And then on the other hand, I had my dad who was like obnoxiously optimistic, like in a way that like even now I can't buy into. I'm like, everything is not awesome, calm down. No one had modeled what it was like to really hone into authentic peace. I didn't know how to honor my real feelings and grab hold of the peace God offers us. That December, I didn't know how to do both those things. Biblical peace, again, offers us and helps us to engage with life in an empowered way. And today we're gonna look at four specific ways that Jesus offers us peace so that we can engage with life. If you're taking notes, this is your next fill-in. One, we learn that Jesus gives us authentic peace with God. The New Testament refers to various pieces that God gives us. There's different types of peace that God extends our way. There's, and peace with God is one of the foundational objective ways that God offers us peace. And this peace is not based on a feeling, this is based on a fact. The Bible tells us that Jesus offers us peace with God. It is a done deal. Here's what Romans 5 says on the topic. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This message of accessible peace for all people is part of what makes the good news message this radical revolutionary idea. That all of a sudden this God entered the scene that was saying, oh, you don't need to earn this. This is something I give you. That it is initiated by God. That it is not something we have to earn. That it is freely given by God. Pastor Troy is gonna talk more about this in a minute too, but for now, what I want us to look at is this idea of, of when we don't feel peace with God. Well, this kind of peace with God, again, is not meant to base, be based on a feeling. The reality is, I know that oftentimes, one of the things that comes up as a pastor, as I talk to people, and just being in community, is that there's a lot of people who believe in God, but who at the end of the day, don't actually feel feelings that stir up authentic peace with God that there's some level of disconnect in there, that they know God is good, but they don't necessarily feel that. And I wanna share a story, and I've shared it before, but I wanna address it again, because I think it's important. There was a time in my life that I struggled with this idea of, of believing that God truly wanted to offer me authentic peace, that I didn't feel the peace with God, even though I, in my head, knew that that was a real thing. I had been a Christian for a while, I was actually on staff at this time, and I felt like I hit this wall in my spiritual journey, where all of a sudden everything I knew about God wasn't lining up with what I was experiencing in life, and then the disconnect that was inside me was just growing. In turn, that became a season of serious deconstruction of my faith, and it was like my faith was down to the studs. Uh, eventually, in the midst of this deep deconstruction, this grueling process that actually ended up in me being in therapy three to four times a month, as I examined the ideas I had with God, along with my doubts and my fears, and I started really wrestling with the things inside of my own heart based on my own life experience um, that all made it hard for me to believe that God was a God who offered me peace with him. Through this grueling process, what God did in that deconstruction is that he gave me a new faith. He reconstructed my faith. There was all these readjustments. And while that season was so difficult, as I leaned in authentically, honestly with God, not for some fake idea of peace, but to say, no, I want to chase and I want to believe that there is peace with God, that God met me very kindly in that process. And if you're here today and this lines up with your story, my encouragement to you is do not settle. Do not settle for a watered down or anxious faith. 
If the ideas you have of God do not stir up this concept of a God who offers you authentic peace, then I would say do your homework and look into what the Bible has to say about Jesus. Because the Bible teaches us that Jesus is the one who teaches us about the nature of God and that a clearer image of Jesus helps us to gain a clearer image of who God is. So my encouragement to you is to do the homework. Lean into those ideas, into what the Bible says, and examine what the hangups are in your own heart. And while Christians and other Christians can teach you a lot about God, my encouragement is to always also remember that some Christians have some real whack ideas about Jesus. You have to say yes to the ways that God is inviting you into this process. Nobody can do it for you. We're gonna look at a passage here from Matthew 11. This verse was one of those, this, that passage was one of those passages that God really used to help cultivate these ideas of what, a peace, what peace with God could actually look like. Here's what a Matthew 11 says. Are you tired, worn out, burnt out on religion? Come to me, get away with me, and you'll recover your life. I'll show you how to take a real rest. Walk with me and work with me. Watch how you, I do it. Learn the unforth rhythms of grace. I won't lay anything heavy or ill-fitting on you. Keep company with me and you'll learn to live freely and lightly. Do you feel peace with God? Or are there ideas with God in your own life that, that, deter, that need to, um, that require you to make some readjustments, to do some deconstruction for the sake of some reconstruction and better ideas of who God is? And if you're here today and you're saying, I feel so good with God, then I would challenge you to say, how are you helping other people feel peace with God? At home, in your community, at school, where you work, Starbucks, Target, you name it. Because if when we know the peace of God, that peace wants to flow through us. And this is what I love about the Christmas offering. It's all about us offering tangible, meaningful peace to other people. When we help uh, by financially supporting a home being built for a family in Tijuana, we help that family experience peace. When we help tra people who have been um, victimized by trafficking get the help they need, we help them experience peace. That video with Logan, this guy was in jail when he got to experience the peace with God, peace with God and what that was like. And if you've given to Christmas offering in the past, you got to be a part of that. If you know what peace with God is like, May we be proactive at being conduits of that very same peace. The second way we can say yes to the peace Jesus offers us is by coming to understand, this is your next fill-in, we learn that Jesus gives us authentic peace in the midst of our circumstances. So earlier I mentioned that Jesus talks, the New Testament talks about different kinds of peace. There's peace with God, and then there's this peace of God. The John 14 verse we looked at, mention this piece specifically, and the Matthew 11 verse we just covered, not to this idea of peace. This piece can be summed up as the settled inner, inner state of being. It's not the peace that comes from a trouble-free life. It's a peace that says that in the midst of real life, I believe that I have access to God's peace. And like we covered last week, this is not about denying pain. That the God depicted in the Bible has no aversion to calling pain pain and to calling things bad. He hears the cry of the hurting, the Bible tells us from the beginning of the Bible, we see this. Spiritual maturity means seeing the darkness as it really is, calling the darkness what it is, understanding that we will not be consumed by it, and then making an empowered choice regarding how we engage in it. It's a choice we get to make. To help get a better glimpse of what this looks like, we're gonna be looking at a passage that is from a letter from the Apostle Paul. The Apostle Paul is one of the most influential people in the early church and is credited as of giving us one of the most clear ideas of what it means to be a person who knows God. As we dive into this verse, I want us to note uh, that when Paul wrote this section of scripture, he is in jail. So Paul is teaching us about biblical peace in the context of a very real hardship. Let's go ahead and jump into Philippians. So here's what Paul says. He says, do not worry about anything. Instead, pray about everything. Tell God what you need and thank him for all he has done. Then you will experience God's peace, which exceeds anything we can understand. His peace will guard your hearts and minds as you live in Christ Jesus. And now, dear brothers and sisters, one final thing. Fix your thoughts on what is true and honorable and right and pure and lovely and admirable. Think about the things that are excellent and worthy of praise. Keep putting into practice all you learned and received from me and everything you heard from me and saw me doing. Then the God of peace will be with you. Paul is saying, let the God of peace be your tour guide. 
And then he's telling us from his method for how he has done this and how he has seen this work. He's giving us his cheat sheet. He tells us to cling to God with honest communication, to notice the good things God has done, to watch how we're thinking, to make sure we're focusing on the right things and to continuously keep taking our next right step. Like Jesus told us in that John 14 passage, Paul is saying, do not let fear guide you. Do not let your fear guide you. Be present and attentive. Become a student to the God of peace. Paul goes on to say in Philippians 4, not that I was ever in need for I have learned how to be content with whatever I have. I know how to live on almost nothing or with everything. I have learned that the secret of living in every situation, whether it is with a full stomach or an empty, with plenty or little, for I can do everything through Christ who has given me strength. The repeated use of the word learned here and this emphasis on Christ giving Paul strength, what this shows us, A, is that Paul is humble and he's teachable. But what Paul is also alluding to here is that this takes effort. That walking in the peace of God is something we cultivate. That while sometimes people talk about this instant peace they get with God, what I have personally observed is that more often than not, this is something we have to work on. That peace is a muscle we have to build. It's a process I would say we have to learn to surrender to. What comes to mind as I was studying these scriptures this week um, is the serenity prayer. This is a very well-known prayer. It's gonna be here on the screen for you. Um, it says, God grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Peace is full of empowerment and it's full of surrender. It's full of this action and this responsibility to take, which Paul shows us, and it's full of this need to let go. When Paul says, I can do everything through Christ who gives me strength, he's in jail. He's not winning by any definition, but he's trusted that God is going to offer him peace regardless of the circumstance in which he finds himself. As I was studying this concept of peace this week, um, I kept thinking of my friend Don who has Marfan syndrome. Uh, it's this, this, this genetic disorder that ends up um, creating some dangerous complications and chronic pain. Don lives her life every single day knowing that in this life, Marfan is not going to stop or go away. And what Don has decided to do is to live her best life regardless of the outcome, regardless of the lack of resolution. So even though she's had to accommodate her life in all these very real ways because of this thing that she cannot control, she has chosen to grab hold of peace and to say, I'm still gonna live fully to my capacity. And I watch her do it and I see her live in peace here and now. In fact, Dawn has become this ruthless, relentless person at believing that peace is accessible no matter the circumstance. Living with her chronic illness and coming to terms with that, coming to peace with that, has taught Don that peace is truly accessible to all of us, even in the situations that are not perfect, even with all the limitations that are very real. And this isn't special to Don. Don is special, but this isn't special to Don. <laughs> This is what peace does. It has a way of wanting to grow and expand. It's like, the, like I, I don't have a yard, but if I had a yard, and I know this is true in other people, so imagine with me. If you plant something in your yard, and it's one of those plants that just tries to consume everything else, it just takes over. That's what peace looks to do. It looks to consume our lives. It doesn't want to stay in a box. Pastor Jorhoy is gonna come out now and he's gonna talk about some of the other ways that peace looks to consume us. As he comes up, here's your next fill-in. We learn that Jesus gives us authentic peace with others. There we go, can you hear me? Yes, it's on. Pastor Carla did a wonderful job, right? Sharing that Jesus, yeah. Sharing that Jesus gives us authentic peace with God and in the midst of our circumstances. And now, Jesus gives us authentic peace with others. As one of your pastors, I have to be transparent. I, I need to let you know something. Uh, that sometimes, not, not all the time, but, but sometimes people get on my nerves. <laughs> Anybody else? And like my, my cousin used to say, I have all these nerves in me, and you're getting on my last one. 
Sometimes people, no one in here, of course, but, but people, they, they irritate me. They can frustrate me. They've, they've hurt me. Has anyone else in here ever been hurt by another person? Have any of you ever disappointed or hurt anyone else? I know that I have. Why? Because we are imperfect people doing life with other imperfect people. You see, we, we work with them, we, we live with them, we go to school with them, we serve with them. Uh, they yell too much at sporting events, <laughs> way too much at sporting events. We, they take our parking spots and our favorite See, people do and say things that are mean and evil all the time. Doing life with people can be very hard. And the result at times can be conflict and pain. But what I want to share with you today is that God wants us to live in a different way, no matter what. Romans 12 and 18 says this, if it is possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. I love another translation that says, do everything in your power to live at peace. That means that we can't control what someone else does, but we can control what we do and how we respond. You see, Jesus came to demonstrate that brokenness can be fixed, that severed relationships can be reconciled, to show compassion towards others, to, to forgive. See, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I am called to live at peace. I am called to live at peace. And one of the best ways we can do that is through forgiveness. In December 2012, there was a fatal single car accident in Irving, Texas that killed one passenger who got inside of a car with a driver who was under the influence. Now, every time I hear these stories, I cringe. It is very tough to hear, but this one was personal. You see, the driver and the passenger were both college football teammates at the University of Illinois while I was currently employed as an athletic academic counselor, so I knew them both. They were really good friends. They were actually like brothers. And at the time of this accident, they were both on the roster of the Dallas Cowboys of the National Football League. And on that night, they were just out having a good time until Josh Brent got behind the wheel of his car under the influence, driving 110 miles per hour in a 45 mile per hour zone with his buddy Jerry Brown in the passenger seat, both not wearing their seatbelt. And then it happened. Apparently the car uh, hit a curb and the car, I guess, flipped at least one time. And when the police showed up, they saw Josh Brent trying to drag Jerry Brown away from a capsized burning car. So they immediately took him to the hospital. And it was there that Jerry was pronounced dead. And Josh Brent was charged with intoxication manslaughter. When we heard this news, it shocked our campus, our community, our athletic department, our coaches, our student athletes, and I'm sure it did the same thing uh, with the Dallas Cowboys organization because at the age of 25 years old, Jerry Brown was gone. And his best friend played a part in his death. But what happened next literally took my breath away. Jerry Brown's mother, Stacy Jackson, she was devastated, of course, but she did the unthinkable. She invited Josh Brent to her son's funeral to sit with her. And it was there at the funeral, she told Josh Brent that he was forgiven. I just can't imagine that a mother who was so broken, who was dealing with overwhelming pain, sitting next to the person who took her son away, who I'm sure caused so much grief and sleepless nights. Yet still, she forgave. Not only that, she wanted all the charges dropped because she knew it was going to be very difficult for Josh Brent to live with this the rest of his life. You see, Ms. Jackson chose to diffuse a potential hostile situation with peace. 
through compassion and forgiveness. You see, Ms. Jackson chose to live at peace with Josh. Now, as powerful as this story is, you need to know that this has happened before on a much larger scale. There was another parent who forgave someone for killing his son. That parent is God the Father. That someone is us. It wasn't just the Romans who crucified Jesus on that cross. All humanity is guilty. We are all at fault. Yes, the Romans nailed Jesus to that cross, but it was our past, present, and future sin who placed them there. And yet still, God forgives us. And so I want you to understand this truth this morning, that you are forgiven. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how bad you think it is. You and I are forgiven. You see, forgiveness is not a suggestion from God, but a command. And to disobey that command is to sin against God. Listen to what it says in Ephesians 4, 32. It says, be kind and compassionate to one another, forgiving each other, just as in Christ he forgave you. And I want you to hear me when I say this, that forgiveness releases us from the prison that unforgiveness places us in. See, forgiveness does not excuse what happened to us, but it excuses us from the power that unforgiveness has over us. You see, unforgiveness keeps us from our destiny because destiny can never be reached through disobedience. We can never receive the full blessing of God by disobeying him. And so one of the greatest things that we can ever do to be like Jesus Christ is to forgive. So here is a couple questions I have for us today. Who do you need to forgive? Who do you need to make peace with? Who is it that hurt you that you need to invite to sit next to you so you can forgive them? See, for some of us, this is an actual person. For some, this is, this is a phone call. And there are some in here that this is not a safe option. And so I'm speaking metaphorically here, but who is it that you need to forgive? There are many of us in here that need to invite ourselves to sit right here. To let go of that thing that you did 20 years ago, 10 years ago, five years ago, five weeks ago, you need to invite yourself to forgive you. If you've asked God to forgive you, he has. So why are we holding on to it? Invite yourself here. There are some that need to forgive those who we've lost. That's, that's not even here any longer. We need to release ourselves with forgiveness. And so I pray and I encourage us to do this today. Do it tomorrow. Do it this week. Let's, let's go of this chain of unforgiveness by, by getting prayer. We're going to have an amazing opportunity towards the end of the service to come down and meet with someone from our prayer team. Let's do it today. And I understand some of you are saying, Troy, I'm not ready. I get it. I know it's very hard. But do this. Continue on the journey to forgive. Allow forgiveness to be the end goal. And I know some of you are thinking, I just don't have the strength to do it. I understand that. But God does. Just ask him. Why? Because he understands. Because at one point, God invited us to sit next to him because of Jesus, and he forgave us. So he understands. So we need to forgive. God did it for us over and over and over again. So Jesus gives us authentic peace with God in the midst of our circumstance within ourselves and with others as we live in peace with them. And for those who are taking notes, the fourth point is this. We learned that Jesus gives us authentic peace in the face of death and loss. My mother and father divorced when I was one, 
and they both end up getting remarried, which caused my older brother and I to move around a lot. We would typically stay with mom during the school year, but then we would live with dad, live with dad for a little bit in the summer months. And up into the fourth grade, I lived in three different states and attended six different elementary schools. And some of my military peeps understand what I'm talking about when it comes to that. But then something strange happened towards the end of my fourth grade year. A mom sent my brother and I from Milwaukee uh, to live at, back home in Danville, Illinois with my dad. And at the time, I didn't know the reason why she was doing it, but I later found out that mom was dealing with a health issue. You see, mom had cancer. And then she later moved to Danville as well to deal with her health issue. And I remember one time uh, my dad told me to go to the hospital and visit mom. And I was so upset because all I wanted to do was go to the park and play. See, my 10-year-old mind could never think that she wasn't going to be okay. I never imagined that the opposite would be true, but it was. A short time later, I remember my dad coming into our bedroom, and as he turned on the lights to share the news that turned the lights out of my soul, that mom has passed away at the age of 31. And the first thing I told myself was, I'm not going to cry. I want to show everybody that I'm tough. I'm not going to shed one tear. And for so many years, I didn't have peace because I had no idea the kind of relationship that my mom had with Christ. Was she a follower of Christ? We didn't go to church that much with my mom, so I had no idea. And then when I accepted Christ, that lack of peace got worse because I didn't know. But can I tell you the best part? Y'all want to hear? There is a best part. 20 years later, at least 20 years, my uncle, my mom's youngest brother, gave my older brother a certificate of baptism with my mother's name written on it. It was dated two months before she passed away. And when I saw that certificate, I got overwhelming peace because I knew because of what Scripture teaches me is that because I'm a believer and she's a believer, I'm going to see mom again. And I praise God for that. Hebrews 2 says this, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death. That is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their own fear of death. Yes, it still hurts. Yes, the pain is real. Yes, the tears will continue to, to fall from the eyes of those who's lost a loved one. But so did it for those on that Friday as Jesus breathed his last breath. But God, I share with, with you some good news. Sunday happened. The day that Jesus defeated death and was raised from the dead so we too can be raised with him. Sunday says that physical death is not the end. It is not over. We don't need to fear a physical death anymore due to eternal life in Jesus. And I do want to address this. There are some of you here uh, that is at a place now where I was, where you don't know where your loved one is regarding Jesus. You have no idea if he or she is with Jesus. I cannot promise you that you're gonna receive a gift like that baptism certificate that I received. I can't promise you that. But what I can promise you is what Pastor Carla talked about, that in the midst of your circumstance, authentic peace is available for you. See, that is why we must continue to share the gospel with those who don't know Christ to invite the unchurched to church, like the Christmas services we have coming up in a couple of weeks. So they can hear about this peace, receive this peace, and live with this peace. This is what I know. 
Authentic peace for believers comes from this truth. The resurrection of Jesus killed death so we can live. The resurrection of Jesus killed death so we can live forever. We don't need to fear what Jesus defeated. So during this Christmas season, we just want you to know that authentic peace is available to you from Jesus and only from him. And so if you want to respond, respond properly to this, the only way to do that is to receive Jesus as your Savior and your Lord. Pastor Carla talked about this earlier, that Jesus created peace between us and God so we can be with him forever. Let's respond. And if you are looking for authentic peace, call on the one who is peace. And I love how it says it in Isaiah 9 and 6. It says this, for a child will be born to us, a son will be given to us, and the government will rest on his shoulders, and his name will be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Eternal Father, Prince of Peace. And so I want to encourage you all this Christmas season to open that gift of peace. And so we're going to close this service by listening to one more worship song. We're going to have our worship team come out. And if you are part of our prayer team, I would love for you to come forward. We're going to listen to this, this last song. And as the song is playing, listen to me. If you want prayer during this song, come down to the front. Some of you may need to deal with this unforgiveness. Some of you uh, may to need to deal with not having enough authentic peace. But just come as the song is playing and meet with someone on our prayer team. But before we do that, I want to pray. And I want to specifically pray for those who may be here today who want that authentic peace who has never made a decision to follow Jesus Christ and you want to do it today. If that is you right now, I'm going to pray for you right where you are. Just lift up your hand. That is you. If you want to receive Jesus, I see you. I see you. God bless you. So if we can all stand and we're going to pray. Pray with me. Father, you uh, say in your word that you desire that all people be saved. And so you sent your son Jesus to die so we can live. And so for those who raise their hand today, they want to receive salvation because of their belief in the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. So God, I ask you now to forgive their sins and invite them into your eternal family forever. And for everyone else, God, I pray that you help us deal with the issues that can keep us from having authentic peace. So as we go and celebrate the birth of your son, I just pray for a birth of authentic peace within us. So God, I pray that you would be with us. As we hear this song, A Beautiful Name, I just want everyone to remember that a beautiful God created a beautiful you so we can worship a beautiful Savior. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.